Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. If you'll be taking a songbook, Stanley will lead us in a song, 217, 217. And after that, uh, Larry Flatt will direct our minds in prayer. Sing the first and the last. Why did the Savior Father in heaven, we thank you for this day of life. We thank you for your blessings, your care, your providence, and for watching over us as we've gone through this day. And we pray, Father, you'll continue to do so. The night as we gain rest and renew our souls and our uh, minds and our bodies to go forth tomorrow and do those things you would have us to do. We're thankful tonight that we can assemble, that we can come together, study from your word, meditate upon it, Apply it as appropriate to our lives. Uh, we pray, Father, that life will continue to be good, that our country can return to the proper ways, that if the standard that, <clears throat> that we govern by would only be the Bible and the things that are taught there. <coughs> Father, forgive us of our sins and be with us. For this prayer we ask in Christ's most holy name. And amen. Amen. If you would, be turning to John, the 12th chapter. John, the 12th chapter. Stanley, I really appreciate that song you led because that's exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight, the love of Jesus Christ. Appreciate that. Well, that's something that we all know and that we, we've studied, we've been taught from children, most of us, about the love of Jesus Christ. And it's the one thing that has to penetrate our hearts and direct our lives every day. We'll never be the people that God wants us to be if our heart is not filled with the love for God and his word. We're going to begin on 12th chapter of John, begin with verse 20. And it just picks up right where Tony left off on his lesson Sunday morning. We had the, the, the delivery that Tony gave us of Jesus' triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. It had been that the chief priests, scribes, and elders, Pharisees, they had been wanting to kill Jesus. Jesus had been staying, staying away from Jerusalem because his time was not near. This is going to be the last few days of Jesus' life. We're going to see as we study the lesson tonight that the time has come. It's the time when Christ would be offered up. I was studying one commentator today, and he, he said that this, we commonly talk about the triumphant entry of Christ into Jerusalem, but it was really his death march into the city of Jerusalem because that is ultimately what awaits him. And we know that at that time, 
The Jews were under Roman occupation. We know that they took those messianic promises in the Old Testament, that it was going to be a literal king upon his throne. And as we studied on Sunday morning, that, as the, the ones who had seen Lazarus raised from the dead just recently, as they had seen all the demonstrations of his power and might and miracles performed, th those were the ones who had told others, and they were lying in that way into Jerusalem. They were cutting down the, the, the palm branches and putting them before Jesus as he rode in up, up on that donkey's coat. And they thought they had their messianic king. They thought that was the leader who was going to overthrow Rome and become the new king that would bring Israel back to what it once was under the days of David and Solomon. But we know that's not what it was because Christ's kingdom was not an earthly one. It was a spiritual one. And because Christ did not fulfill what they wanted, he was rejected. They were looking for an earthly. And we're going to look on a little bit on this tonight. Now let's, let's begin on verse 20. Christ has entered into Jerusalem. Now, uh, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Basidia in Galilee, and they asked him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew went and told Jesus, and Jesus will, will answer them. So we see here, as, as we start on tonight's lesson, we have, it's not just the Jews that wanted to see Jesus, it, it's some Greeks, Gentiles, who, who had heard about him, who had heard about his miracles, and, and they wanted to see Jesus as well. Now, now, they wanted to see what was being talked about. They, they wanted to see this king. They, they, they wanted to see this, this one who could do all these miracles. But they had the right idea. They want to see Jesus. Which, as we look at those words, the thought should come to our minds. Do we want to see Jesus as well? It should be a driving thought within our minds and within our hearts. A daily thing. Do we want to see Jesus? You know, I'm not going to tell you anything new. It's something we all know. It's so easy to get caught up in this world. It's so easy to get caught up in life because it's full of distractions. You've got your jobs. You've got families. And sometimes that can be a lot right there. You've got neighbors that may or may not be good neighbors. You've got different involvements. You've got your children's lives. You've got your grandchildren's lives and others. And you're being pulled one way or another. And we got responsibilities. It's getting harder to pay bills. Finances are hard to come by at times. And we know inflation is upon us. And we've got all of these things in life. And sometimes we lose sight of the eternal, of what's important. And, and we need to t tell ourselves and, until it becomes part of us. We want to see Jesus. And ultimately, at the end of this life, we want to be with God in heaven. The, the, the old song that we sing, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. That's how it needs to be. That, that's how it should be with us. It is so easy to put down roots. Because if if at times in our life, it is good, and it's real good at times, and we get comfortable here. We get comfortable with where we're at and what we're doing and the people that we're with, and we're wrapped up in the here and the now, and Jesus is going to tell us here, we need to be thinking about what happens at the end of this life. We can't just look at the now. We've got to look at the eternal. 
So Jesus tells these that wanted to see him, and he answers it in a strange way. But he's letting not just these Greeks know that wanted to see him, but he's letting all know. Look what he says in verse 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. As we said earlier, but before this, it, this time wasn't there. His time wasn't right. He couldn't let the Jews get a hold of him. The time was not right. He got away from their, their, all their schemes and their plans and ideas. He withdrew himself uh, out of the city. But now the time has come. He knows what awaits him. He knows what's going to happen. He knows he's going to have to die on that cross. And he knows what that's involved. Look what he says in verse 24. Truly, truly, that is verily, verily, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You that are farmers and uh, raise flowers or crops or whatever, you, you understand that principle, we know it. That seed, we can lay it out on a table and look at it, and nothing's ever going to grow from it nothing's ever going to flourish. But we can take that same seed and bury it in the earth. It dies, and it comes up. And whatever we have planted, it, it produces that flower or that fruit or that vegetable or whatever it would be. Christ is comparing his life to this. He said, my, my time has come. And he gives the analogy of, of, the, uh, of the seed here. He said, he, too, must go into that earth, and he must die in order that much fruit would be produced. That much fruit is the church. That, more, that much fruit is Christian. Without his death on the cross, there is no church. There is no Christian. There is no forgiveness of sins. There is no reconciliation. There's no salvation. None of it was possible if he doesn't die upon that cross. You know, we sometimes think that the Son of God, and he did know what he was going through, but can you imagine the burden of having to know what you're going to have to do? That it's up to you. You're the only person that can save the world. You're the only person that can save the world. But you know in order to do that, you're going to have to die a horrible, painful, suffering death. You know, I think most of us would have wonderful, giving, glorious hearts. And we would sacrifice so much for the benefit of mankind, and especially those we love. But he knew something else. He knew that mankind would reject him for the most part. He would die for a sinful world that rejected him. And he would die in such of a painful manner. But he knows that he must. He must in order for fruit to be born. Verse 25. Whosoever loves his life loses it. And whosoever hates his life in this world will keep it for themselves, will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now, we need to notice what Jesus is saying. Remember, th these are his final days. These are some of his final words before his resurrection again. So uh, these words are important. And he says, if you love your life, if you love this earth, if you love what it provides, and your love for self, and your love for this life keeps you from following him, then you will lose everything. But if you set aside your life, if you 
Give it to Christ and not to self. He said, then you will have that promise of eternal life. And you, this is not something new that Jesus is saying. It's something that he taught from the very beginning when he set forth the ground rules of discipleship. Remember what he said you must do? Three things. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow him. Three things. Jesus has always said that. Don't come after me if you're not willing to deny yourself. He's saying it again. He said it at the first of his ministry. He's saying it at the last of his ministry. You've got to deny yourself what you want, and you've got to follow after God. If anyone, verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Okay, he must follow me. Where is Jesus headed? The cross. He's headed to the cross. And he said, well, if you're going to follow me, you must be headed to the cross as well. You know, Paul said it so well in Galatians, the second chapter, and in verse 20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said that he died on that, cry, on that cross just like Christ did. In that, he gave up self. He crucified self. He crucified his wants, his needs. And what comes first is what God wants of him. Jesus expects the same, not just of Paul, but of all of us as well. We need to be willing to do that. We should be willing to do that. When we think of the Savior who left heaven, and we can't even begin to imagine how glorious and how beautiful that is, but he left that knowing he was coming to earth to die on the cross, and yet he loved mankind that much, knowing what he must give up. And he came to this earth, and he lived as mortal man. He, he, he hurt. We know he cried. He felt things as we feel them because of that human part of him. He knows and he understands. And he had emotions just as we have emotions. And he gave up his life for our sins. That could be the only sacrifice. There is nothing that mankind could have done to save himself. It took a pure, sinless sacrifice. And there was no one on the face of the earth who met that qualification. It took the very Son of God coming down to live as man and to die on that cross for the sins of mankind. That's such of a beautiful thought. That needs to be in our hearts and minds at all times. Just as Paul, I, I've been crucified for Christ. Christ says, you follow me. We follow him to the cross. We crucify self. We crucify our needs and our wants. And Christ's needs and his wants come first in our life. That's what Paul said that he was going to do. That's what Jesus directs he, us to do. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant. We must be where Jesus wants us to be, in the places that he walked, doing what he did, and we must follow that example. And he gives us this beautiful promise. If anyone serves me, if we follow him, if we crucify self, if we walk after him and follow him, the Father will honor him. It's not a great sacrifice to give up our life on this earth to have the eternal glories of heaven. But that's what it's going to take. But if we like this earth and we're not willing to give it up, we've just given up heaven. It's a choice of one 
or the other. And we each have to make that decision. Jesus says, if, if you choose to follow me, if you choose to serve me, then God will honor you because you by your life have glorified God. See, obedience to the will of God is how God is glorified. That's how we in our daily lives bring, bring glory to God, that we do what he says, just like you as earthly parents when raising up your children. It, it, when they did what you wanted them to do, uh, made you feel good, made you happy. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. God wants us to do the same thing, and that's how we glorify him. Now, verse 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Remember, he, he just said that the, the, the hour and the time has come. And look at the honesty here. The very Son of God admits, I, I'm troubled. We would be too, wouldn't we? If we knew just a few days down the road, we were going to be nailed to a cross in agonizing pain and hang there till we die. He was troubled, and he admits it. He said, I'm troubled. But, but what am I going to say? What am I going to say? He said, am I going to say, Father, save me from this hour? No, he came for this hour. That's why he did come. He said, I, I can't do that. I can't ask for God's help. But for this purpose have I come to this hour. Now is why I fear. There, there is a purpose. There is a reason. And, and he did it. You can never lose sight of that. He did it because he loved his creation. He did it because he loved us. And he asked us, in return, will you love me? Will you follow me? That's what he asked. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. He prays in verse 28, Father, glorify your name. And notice what happens. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Jesus, after he had told the, the multitude about Again, what, what he's going to have to do, that his hour has come, that, that he's troubled, uh, he, he's anxious, he's apprehensive about what's going to happen. But he said, for this purpose, that's why I've come, and so that your name would be glorified, Father. He did the will of his Father. God so loved the world, John 3.16 that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus brought glory to the Father, and he did it by obeying his will. Again, same way we show glory to God is by being obedient and doing his will. God said, I have glorified it, that is, the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and I will glorify it again. He glorified it again at the resurrection. But notice, verse 29, the crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said that an angel has spoken to him. They didn't hear the words, but they heard the, the, the majesty, the rumbling of the voice of God. You remember that this along the same lines of what happened at Mount Sinai. As Moses approached the mountain and went up to convene with God, the lightnings, and then God spoke, and it was like a thunder. It had their attention, and certainly here it is here. The people hear it, and they 
they said that it thundered, that voice. And others, that an angel had spoken to. They didn't know what it was, but they attributed it to the divine, that what had just happened here because of the words that Jesus spoke. Now, Jesus tells them in verse 30, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people unto me. Jesus said the, 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 the thundering, the, the, the voice of God was done, done not for me. It, it was done for your purpose. That was valid, that validation that God heard the Son and spoke to him that way. To, to prove to the people this is who Jesus said he was, the very Son of God. Come for your sake. But he said, now, now, this time, his death upon the cross and what it will signify and what it will bring about, that's the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. The ruler of this world, of course, we know is Satan. So he said, Satan's going to lose his hold on mankind because of what's going to happen. But right in previous to Jesus' death upon that cross. We know that Satan's hold on the world was that man lived under sin. That, that, there, was, there was no forgiveness. There was no reconciliation. See, man's sins had kept him from God. And Jesus' death will remove that. We remove that separation and allow mankind through obedience to how his sins forgiven so that there can be reconciliation between God and man. And, and there can be salvation offered to mankind. So the, the ruler of this world will be cast out. He won't have that hold over man. And not only is his hold over man, but his hold over death as well. Remember, Paul said, oh, oh, death, where is thy sting? We still sorrow at death. But for the Christians, for our brothers and sisters who have died, we miss them. Oh, but we know they have a beautiful, eternal home with God. So th there is not that sting of death. If this earth is all there is, and there is nothing beyond, there is a sting, there is a sadness, there is an eternal sadness and no hope after this life. But we know that there is more, and God gives us that, and he gives us that eternal blessing that we find in obedience unto his son. So, he said, judgments not only come upon this world that's lived in sin and has rejected him. There's going to be a judgment. Also upon the ruler of this world. And when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Verse 33 explains that. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Jesus knew that he was going to be crucified. He knew that he would die upon that cross. And he knew what that would involve. As that cross was laid down, he was laid on it. He was nailed to it. And then that cross was set upright, went into the ground, and he would die on that. He would be raised. He would be lifted up from the earth. Now, he knew that to some that this would be a symbol of shame. But he said that it would draw all men to him. Mankind on hearing the gospel message. And we all know what that is. The good news of the gospel. Somebody ask you, what's the good news of the gospel? It's that a Savior has died for you. That there is hope for your life. That there is more than this life upon this earth. That there is eternal pleasure, 
and joy and happiness after this life. Just thinking about that thought, don't that make you smile? Don't that make you want that every time we think about it? And we need to think about it more. Because Satan don't want us to. Satan wants us to just get so consumed in this life and, and who's going to be president and how those people over here and all these people over here. And we forget about the eternal. We forget about what's important. But we forget, sadly, to our own detriment, that we have a Savior who's died for us. And that that's a wonderful blessing that he brought up on this earth by giving himself. That we now have a Savior who lived up on this earth, died, buried, rose again on the third day, ascended back into heaven, and now sits at the right hand of the throne of God, being our mediator between God and man. Oh, I, yeah, I know what they're feeling. Jesus knows. That's a wonderful blessing. And he said, if you'll just do my will, I'll share what I have with you. He told the, the, the disciples, I, I go now to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. That's not just them, that's us. We have that promise. That, that's a beautiful thought that we need to keep. Jesus says that I will draw all people to me. Now, the crowd now, hearing these words, that they're a little confused. Now, now you ask him in 34, uh, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Well, you know, J Jesus called himself that, the Son of Man, it, also the Son of God. He, dual. He, he was of God, but he was born of woman. So he's the Son of God, but also the Son of Man. So he was talking about himself, as, as we know. And, and the people didn't understand because the, the they were, they were rightly taught that the, the, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior lives forever. And, and you're talking about you're going to die? They didn't understand the resurrection. They didn't understand that he gives his life now and it will be given unto him back by God at the resurrection when he arises from that tomb on the third day. So they didn't understand that. So he says unto them in verse 35, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Jesus said, you, you, you're only going to have me for a short while. It's now down to a number of days. And then he will be with them no longer. So he said, well, while you have them here, walk in the light. For those who walk in the we know Jesus used this illustration many times. The, the, the light is the light of God's light. The darkness is the darkness of sin. Mankind's going to walk in one of the two, and we get to decide. The, the world likes the darkness of sin. They don't like to have their sins revealed. They don't like to be told, you, you can't do this, you can't do that, or you're going to have to do this. The light guides man to how he should direct his life and his footsteps. The darkness covers mankind. So he said, while you can, while you have the opportunity, walk in the light. Because you walk in the, the darkness, then you don't know where you're going. We won't in life if we don't follow God. So while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be sons of light. Now, Jesus said, well, you have the opportunity. Now, now he knew that it wouldn't be long till the church would be established. 
there'd be a day of Pentecost, that, that there would still be a time even after he is gone. But there is such of an urgency to obeying God. He said, do it now. Believe in the light that you may become sons of light. While you have the light, while he is there with them, he said, follow me now. Do what God wants you to do while you have the opportunity. Because we all know how man is. If we put it off, it gives our hearts time to harden. And we may not ever obey him. The best opportunity to obey God is always now because we may never have another. You know, John, in the first chapter, in verses 11 through 13, when he was speaking about Jesus, he had these words to say. You want to be turning there. John 1, beginning with verse 11. Talking about Jesus, he said, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. We know that he was born of the Jewish race, and they did not receive him. They rejected him. But to all who did receive him, verse 12, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It's children of light, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's that second birth that, like he explained to Nicodemus, we must be born again and, and follow after Christ, that you may become sons of light. Jesus said, or John in, in chapter 1 there said, sons of God, synonymous terms, sons of light, sons of God. We have that wonderful opportunity. You know, it, it, it's wonderful to have families upon this earth and, and say that I, 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 I'm a son of so-and-so, and I'm a son of so-and-so. And, and it's wonderful to belong, and it's wonderful to have people here love us. But the most marvelous thought that mankind can ever get into his head, that through our obedience and faithfulness, we can be sons of God. That's a generic term, children of God. Men and women, we can be children of God. That's a beautiful thought. God the eternal, so that we just can't even hardly grasp our minds around it, is willing to adopt us into his family through obedience. That is a wonderful blessing that we should ever think about in our life. And Jesus, here in his last days of his life, he wanted people to know that. But look at the next verse here. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. We know even though his time was now, it was still a few days off, and he could not allow himself to be captured, so he withdrew from the people. Though he had done, verse 37, though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. That, you know, we look back at that and say, how could these people not, be, not believe? He was right before their eyes. He raised people from the dead. That's amazing. He, people who were dying, he, he restored their health to them. He restored their sight to them. He restored their hearing to them. That is amazing, all that he did. And they did not believe because he wasn't what they wanted. They wanted that earthly king. And for, for us, if people reject us, you know, it's easy just to move on. He could. He would. He did he couldn't. He had to die for all of mankind. Even those who rejected him, even those who hated him, even those who killed him. So that the word, verse 38, we'll look at some prophecies here as we're closing. 
so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 39, therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and has hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes and, would, and understand with their heart, and turn and would heal them, and I would heal them. We see that the, Isaiah made these the prophecies concerning how the people would treat the Savior, and they said that they would reject him. I see Kurt's about ringing the bell here. Thank you for your time and your attention tonight. It's good to see everyone out with us tonight. Uh, our scripture reading tonight is taken from Psalms chapter 23, verse number five. The first song tonight is number 400. If you want to take out a song book and turn to number 400. The invitation song is number 701. The only update that I have to the sick list that Joe If you would please stand we'll be singing number 400 the first and third verse <clears throat> i care not today what the morrow may bring if shadow or sunshine or Oh, 
we go to God in prayer. Our holy and reverent Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening with so much thankfulness in our hearts. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this congregation that meets here at Bobby Branch for each individual that is represented here. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, that they have the desire to want to come together and to study and meditate upon your word to help us to be more prepared to do the things that you would have us to do. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the community we live in, where the church is so prevalent. There are so many faithful congregations in our area, and we all know that the church can meet and worship at any time we please with no fear of persecution from man. Heavenly Father, we are so blessed with so many material things. We know that all of these good things come from thee. We pray that each one of us will enjoy these things that you have given us, but we pray that we will never let them hinder us in any way from worshiping you and putting you first in our life. Heavenly Father, we know that there are sick of our congregation. We know that they are sick of our community. Please be with all of those who are sick. Be with those in the, the doctors, the hospitals, and the nursing homes. Help those who are taking care of them to do those things that are most needful to make them comfortable in this time of their sickness. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we especially pray for the country we live in. Our country is in turmoil. Heavenly Father, we know that there are those who want to put you out of our society and to teach our children to not worship you. Heavenly Father, we pray that the uh, this election coming up, that Christians will examine these candidates and that we can elect the one who is most likely to let us continue to worship you and that is most likely to fight against the evil things that are being trying to be taught to our children in this country. We know, Heavenly Father, that we sin and fall short, and we pray that you will forgive us whenever we fall short of these things. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the plan of salvation that you made for us. For Jesus, who came to this earth, who walked among men, who had no sin and died for us so that we could live with you eternally in heaven when this life is over. We are so thankful, Heavenly Father, for this privilege that we have to be part of your kingdom. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Reading is coming from Psalms 23, verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. A few weeks back, Brandon did our Wednesday evening devotional, and he talked about his plight with the cicadas. So tonight, I've entitled my lesson, The Garden and the Groundhog, and you'll see why in a moment. As the season turned, it became time to plant my garden. So like Joe, who's not here tonight because he's told me many times, and I suspect others of you 
we buy the little seedlings or we start our own seed, plant some seeds, and then we pot them up and we put them into bigger pots. We put them under grow lights, we pamper them, we get them ready. And then when the time has come, when the weather is good and the ground is just right, we plant those things that we have grown up. And we expect a good return on the things we put in our garden. So I did that. I put out my squash and my okra and my peppers and my cucumbers and my tomatoes. Life is good. Now, based on a previous year's experience with some deer, I've got a four-foot fence around my garden. It has its own dedicated electric fence charger. It runs almost 9,000 volts. So if you get into this, you're gonna know, you're gonna know that you've been in a hot fence. So everything should be good, right? Well, so I thought. But a couple of days later, I found that about half the plants were only stems, if that much. So what can it be? I checked the fence. It's still extremely hot, if you will use the term. The voltage is there. I go around the fence. There's not a place that's more than two inches high. So what's going on? By now, a week or so later, my corn is up. And what do I know? It starts to disappear. So now I put out some traps. Not just one, but two, nothing. After several days, they're still empty. And so early one morning, I look out and there he is, my friend, the groundhog. So I think, well, apple should be good in that trap. So I put an apple in the trap, one inside the fence, one outside the fence. Days go by, plants still continue to disappear. Nothing in the trap. Well, now, peanut butter and apple. That ought to get any rodent, right? Day goes by, nothing. Now, not only is this groundhog smart and coy, he also taunts me. He sees me come and he runs on a, a large pile of lumber I have in my shed. He sits on top of the lumber and defies me to try and catch him. So what do you do? Well, as we work through this, I begin to reflect on our relationship, my relationship with the groundhog. And it began to make me think that for the most part, the devil is like the groundhog. He watches how we move. He knows where we go. He knows what we do. He learns from our behavior the best ways that he can ensnare us. Now, unlike my ability to catch this groundhog with bait, how susceptible are we as humans, we as Christians, to certain kinds of bait that we find irresistible? Psalms 91 verse 3 says, Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. Now, what this verse reminds me of is the fact that there is someone, the devil, out there trying to trap us, just like I was trying to trap this groundhog. But we, as Christians, have God to help us stay free from the traps of sin. James chapter 4, verse 7, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. As followers of Christ, we must stay aware, alert, diligent, and persistent. Remembering that the devil prowls continuously, he prowls around. He looks for every crack, every possibility of a place where he can deceive us. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. <clears throat> Be alert of sober and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The psalmist, as was just read to us, assures us that God, if we are faithful to his ways, will help us stay out of the snare of the devil. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemy. So therefore we know that God, by our belief in him, our, our obedience to him, that he's gonna be there for us to help us. 
So now I can tell you're on the edge of your seat wanting to know the rest of the story. What really happened? Well, last night, <coughs> excuse me, last night I had a supper of corn, squash, tomato, and okra, but I didn't have any cucumbers. I am glad to say I won the war, but the groundhog won one of the battles. He got my cucumbers. So if you, as an individual, are growing weary of trying to win against the devil, you, like I did, can win the war. Occasionally, the devil will win the battle, but just like the song we sing says, the battle belongs to the strong. So if we're strong, if we're persistent, we can achieve, we can overcome. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 promises that God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure. So while the devil may be and is out there prowling about, our God is busy providing a way that we can be protected. In Romans 12, chapter 2, Paul writes, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. So where do we begin? Where do we begin our defense against the devil? Well, we begin as taught in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18, that we put on the full or whole armor of God. Now, the full armor of God is a powerful weapon. It is our defense in defeating the devil, conquering the strongholds of our life, and overcoming the daily battles. How do we put on the whole armor? By becoming a Christian or by returning to a way of life, that straight path that will lead all of us to heaven. So tonight, let me encourage you, whenever you find yourself being tempted, when the devil is prowling around waiting for you to take the bait, remember what 1 John chapter 4, 4 and verse 4 says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Tonight, if you have any need to make your life right or to become a Christian, we encourage you to come at this time as we stand and sing. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. There's danger and death and delay.
Our Father, our God, and our Lord in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity and this freedom that we have to worship you without fear, without fear of bodily harm or persecution. We pray, Father, that we may, ha may have been edified and strengthened this evening. We pray that we may learn your will more perfectly, and we pray that uh, the outside world will see you through us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.